Anything else? Well, welcome again, as I said. Um, Maury Yip, not a stranger to many of you. She has been a part-time and recently more than part-time resident of Lovell for the past 38 years. Uh, she is a British linguist with a distinguished career, uh, first at Brandeis and then at UK, University of California, Irvine, and finally at the University of London, uh, where she was a professor of linguistics. She is retired uh, blissfully, I'm sure. Uh, and she, was, she directed the Center for Human Communication. And her field is phonology, that is uh, the science of sounds of language, uh, the systems of language sounds, and particularly the phonology of Chinese. Uh, all of which may sound as if it doesn't have a lot to do with wolves and cliff churches in Ethiopia, but really I, I believe at some deeper level it does. Um, if you know Maura here locally in Lovell, you know that she has been involved with the natural world of Lovell for quite a while. Uh, three years ago, I think it was, she brought the, uh, the BBC uh, wildlife unit to film in New England and particularly in Lovell. She has a wonderful blog. If you are not subscribing to it, don't forget it. It's called Eyes on the Wild. And she's a brilliant photographer. And during the pandemic year, she chose to create a year of photographs of the natural world in Lovell. This is available at your local library. I don't know if there are any more copies in the universe. Are there? Um, there's, I gave one to the library. I gave one to the historical society and one to the store. So you can take a look there. These are astonishing. If I did one, one, I could get one printed for you, but they're terribly expensive to print, but, which I can't help. But if you love photography, you won't mind. Anyway, I'm holding on to this, but you can look at it later for, <laughs> for a fee. Uh, anyway, so the reason that all of these things are connected really is curiosity. Uh, in my view, Maury Yip is really what happens um, when a stunning example of what can happen when you combine a keen artistic sense and tremendous intelligence and rampant curiosity. She is a world traveler, uh, hence Ethiopia and many other places. And her curiosity has allowed her, has asked, has led her to ask a lot of interesting questions about phonology and animals. So maybe we're coming around to wolves. Uh, is there such a thing as animal phonology, she writes? Uh, what might be the connection between bird sounds, bird songs, and human communication? Years ago, she spoke to us on that topic. So tonight, Tonight, you're going to find the links between world, cliff churches, wolves, phonology, all of it through Maria. Maura, welcome. That's a very hard introduction to follow. Thank you, Joe. Um, you, you'll be relieved to hear that phonology plays absolutely no role in what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, <laughs> So I've been to Ethiopia twice, uh, just as a tourist, but they were very unusual trips, and I fell in love with the country. Um, if after I've talked, there's a couple of things on a table at the back, and an audience member, Del Ross, who many of you know, tells me that her husband grew up in Ethiopia, and she's just brought a crocodile skin from Ethiopia that's on the table at the back, so you should definitely look at that. And there's also a book like my Lovell book that I made after my second trip to Ethiopia, which I think someone's, it was on the table, but I think it's going around the room. So do take a look at that if you want to. Just don't walk off with it, please. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I went to Ethiopia twice. Um, the brief overview is that the first trip was organized by a friend of mine who runs a foundation that restores the wall paintings and the Bibles and the other church liturgical equipment inside the medieval churches in the cliffs in Northern Ethiopia. Um, and she took a group of friends, just 12 of us, to see the places where they've been working. And we traveled around parts of Ethiopia that are not easy to get to under normal circumstances. Um, and then the second trip was entirely different because I love wildlife, as many of you know. I really wanted to see the Ethiopian wolf, which is highly endangered. So I've, there's an organization in the UK called Nature Trek um, who do what it says on the box. They take people on nature treks 
and they ran a small group that went to see the endemic mammals of Ethiopia, the mammals that are found nowhere else in the world, one of which is the Ethiopian wolf. So uh, the second trip had that very focused thing. So neither of these was a terribly standard tourist trip, partly because the hotels are often unthinkably bad by most of our Western standards. Um, so you, you walk into the hotel and the first thing you do is flick the light switch to see whether anything happens and often it doesn't. Then you turn on a faucet to see if anything happens and often it doesn't. But if it does, then you think, oh, water, that's good. And then you try the hot water faucet to see if it's any different from the cold water faucet. Um, and then you strip the bed and have a look at the sheets. And then you, you know, so you deal with it, it's fine, but it's difficult for a Western mainstream tourist company to take people there because they can't provide the kind of tourist infrastructure that for most people are, are pretty essential. Um, but it was just a wonderful trip. So both of these were. So that's what I'm going to talk about. The first half will be about the first trip, mostly about the cliff churches, but I'll begin with an overview of the country and the life of the country. And at the very, very end, in case any of you are wondering, I will return to the situation in Ethiopia right now, um, which is catastrophic, and I will talk about that. Um, okay, so let's see if my slides are going to advance. That wasn't a good sign because that one didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, this is really not a good it sign. Did. Oh, we did. Okay, just a bit slow. Okay. Um, so, um, in case you're not sure where Ethiopia is, that's the UK where I live part of the year. I'm a US citizen, by the way, but I do still spend some of my time there. And you fly to Africa, and Ethiopia is there. Okay. Um, and Ethiopian Airlines is one of the best airlines in the world, and it's easily the best airline in Africa. It's terrific, absolutely top-notch airline. Uh, it had a proud history. It goes back a very, very long way, 4.4 million years. Some of the earliest hominid remains have been found in Ethiopia. Uh, and it, unlike most African countries, it's never been properly colonized by a Western country. And they're very proud of that, rightly so. Um, the, one of their generals was the first African general to defeat a European army. He defeated the Italians at the Battle of Adwa. And here is a rather fine painting of the Battle of Adwa with the Ethiopian troops on the left and the Italian troops on the right. I rather <laughs> like this. Um, the last emperor, Haile Selassie, ruled for 44 years, known as the Lion of Judah. Uh, and that's the imperial flag on the right. And he was, there are all kinds of very interesting books about this rather extraordinary man, extraordinary in both good and bad ways. Um, it's a, like many African countries, it has a number of different um, ethnic groups who speak different languages, and that leads to all kinds of political issues and so forth. The official language is Amharic, which is Semitic language, means it's related to Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, and uh, the largest language is Oromo, which is not immediately uh, related to them. And in the north, where I went on my first trip, they speak a third language called Tigrinya, which is also Semitic. Um, I don't know why it did that. Okay. Hmm. It's not advancing. Okay. They have their own alphabet, 238 letters. <laughs> Um, we can zoom in a little bit on them if this will behave, which it won't always. There we go. Um, it's actually something called a syllabary, but I promised you I wouldn't do linguistics, so I'm not going to. I'm going to move on. Um, and this is the Declaration of the Human Right of Human Rights in Amharic. And if it will play. Yes, it was a bit quiet. Could you hear it? Yeah. Um, so my first trip was to the north, an area called Tigre, which has more than one spelling in English. In 2011, organizers said with this friend of mine, Blair Priday, and her foundation. And you'll see a little bit about what they do as the talk goes on. Um, so the part of Ethiopia we went to, let's zoom in on the country, it's very mountainous, as you can see, and diagonally across from roughly sort of top right to bottom left is a string of lakes. And that's the Great Rift Valley, which many of you have probably heard of. And the early hominid remains were found in parts of that Great Rift Valley. And then of course it continues on down through Kenya where they found many other ones. And the area of Tigray is in the north up here. 
It's on the borders with the country of Eritrea, which we'll return briefly to when we talk about what's going on right now in the country. Um, so that's where we went. This is a Google Maps just of Tigray. And um, that those, these are the towns we went to that Google Maps knows exist. So I, I tried typing in other ones that Google Maps had never heard of, so it couldn't do this for me. Um, it says that we drove for only six hours, but that's simply not true. The roads are, how can I put it, um, uh, minimal. So that distance didn't actually take us six hours. That's what Google thinks it would take because they don't, they've never been on these roads and they've got no idea. Um, so this is our local guide, Haile Selassie, and you're beginning to see what, yeah, lots of people that are called Haile Selassie because after their former emperor. Um, and uh, you're beginning to see what the terrain looks like in Tigray. It's very dramatic. So the flatter parts are intensively farmed, uh, beautifully farmed, uh, by completely medieval methods. You see, we saw, for most of the time we were there, we ne never saw another vehicle with an internal combustion engine. Everything was pulled by horses or oxen or donkeys or people. Um, and everything's meticulously farmed, but then they have these dramatic rock formations. The houses are built of the local stone. And you can see here, they farm barley and they farm a grain called teff, which is in the foreground in the top right-hand picture. And that remarkable bird is the, the uh, giant African horn, ground hornbill. And that's just its head poking up above the grain. They're huge, they're about this big. And the wildflowers are gorgeous as well. Um, the people uh, work very hard. And as I say, they just, this was just a woman working in the fields. But I thought she was so beautiful. So I took her picture. Um, but it's hard work when you have to plow like that. That's how people around here used to plow, of course. And, but that's a long time ago, not anymore. Um, it's just a boy in a tree who I liked. There's a couple of donkeys, sheep, and these wonderful old trees, which I think are strangler figs by the looks of it. Uh, and horses, still a major means of transportation. And the men carry sticks, and it's a sign of being an adult male and an elder and a leader. And so the stick is an important uh, social signifier. Um, the markets are wonderful. I mean, I love markets everywhere I go, but these were particularly nice. So these are eggs being sold, and the two <laughs> gentlemen in the foreground are talking about something important. I don't know what. Um, this guy is selling cut, and cut is uh, something you chew, and it uh, has roughly the effect of drinking an awful lot of cups of very strong coffee. Um, <laughs> it makes you quite um, buzzy and, and high and so forth. Uh, and it has all kinds of, if, you're, if, you eat, if you chew too much of it, it has all kinds of bad side effects. It rots your teeth or whatever, but it's a, a popular thing there. Um, just kids. The women uh, have wonderful hairstyles and I got absolutely mesmerized by them. Um, so most of the time, if I photograph someone, unless I'm behind them and they have no idea, if I photograph, I always ask first. So these women didn't know because they had their backs to me. These girls, I asked, and they said, sure. And then as I clicked, she got covered with embarrassment and fell into a heap of giggles. And <laughs> but she had said it would be fine, and her friend thought it was pretty funny. So that's OK. Um, and these two, I think the one on the left is particularly, she's got this lovely bit down the middle that I thought was great. Um, the woman on the left is selling baby carriers. You put your baby in these and strap them to you, and they're made of calf skins, I think. And on the right, if you want a chicken for dinner, that's how you buy it. And then you take it home and wring its neck. Or, yeah. um, Ethiopian food is based around something called injera, which is a sort of flatbread. So you see a sort of beige colored, very large pancake on the bottom of that dish. That's injera. It's made out of this grain called teff. And it's a, it is a pancake and it's slightly sour because it's a little bit fermented. And then on it, you put um, helpings of uh, dishes called wats, which are stews of various kinds. Some of them are very spicy, but not all of them. A lot of them are vegetarian, but again, not all of them. And there are days of the week when people eat only vegetarian food. And then you take a piece of the pancake, if you look at the right-hand picture, and you tear it off and you use it to scoop up some of the wat. Um, I thought it was absolutely delicious. I just love the food. 
Um, coffee is very important in Ethiopia. It is the country where the coffee bean tree originates from. So that's the first place that coffee grew. And there is a ritual surrounding it. You roast the beans on a charcoal brazier, you can see in the middle there. And, and then you put it in a pestle of mortar and you grind the beans and then you make the coffee. And it's really delicious. And the other great thing in Ethiopia is that because it was occupied, not colonized, but occupied by the Italians for five years, everywhere you go in the middle of nowhere, they've got an espresso machine. <laughs> And since I drink double espresso, I thought I died and gone to heaven because most of the time when I'm traveling in Africa, it's not easy to get my kind of coffee. You get, you know, sort of Nescafe kind of coffee. Um, so I'm now going to, that was a bit of the sense of the countryside and what life was like there. And now I'm going to talk about the rock churches. So this is a deeply Christian part of Ethiopia. Uh, it was made the state religion in the fourth century AD and developed rather independently from the rest of the Christian world because there was sort of Islam in between, so to speak. Um, but 43% of the population uh, are um, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. And at some point around, from when Christianity arrived until around about the 14th century, they started carving churches into those vertical rock cliffs that you saw briefly and you're gonna see more of in a minute. And you have to climb up to them and then there's a church up there and the reason they did it was that the higher you are the closer you are to god um, so the actual churches are often very hard to date no one knows exactly when the church was built or carved um, but the paintings can often be dated by archaeologists by taking tiny scrapings of the paint and so forth and the paintings seem to be the earliest ones seem to be somewhere around the 12th century and they kept, went on painting them until around the 18th century. These churches are still used. So the paintings and also the Bibles and other things that you will see um, are being used by the local priests and monks, which means they're not in air conditioned museum conditions and they're being touched and handled and the pages are being turned all the time. So a lot of them are in bad state of disrepair. And um, the priests don't want to part with them. They don't want to put them in museums. They want to use them and they don't necessarily want outsiders tinkering with them. In the monasteries, uh, women can't go in. So there are things that uh, some of our groups saw that I didn't see because I'm a woman and so I couldn't see them. Um, but the Ethiopian Heritage Fund has developed ties and links and access. Blair's husband, Mark Winston Lee, is a bookbinder by trade and a classic, be beautiful, you know, leather bound books. That's what he does. So he has helped restore some of the Bibles and the oldest, Bibles here are the oldest known illustrated Christian manuscripts. They go back to the fifth century, fifth or sixth century. So they're really old, they're very, they're quite special. And it's important to preserve them. So we're gonna to go to some of these cliff churches. These are the kinds of roads, the ones that Google Maps does not show, doesn't know they exist. Uh, and if you look on the left at the wall of that house, look how beautifully the stone is constructed over here. It's just lovely. This is taken from the window of the van. That funny thing in the bottom is the license sticker on the window of the van. <laughs> um, and, oh, sorry, I meant to go. There we go. Um, these churches are carved out of the cliffs and then they build a little entranceway, a little facade. So this is the entrance to one of the churches and that's one of the priests in front of it. Um, and around the outside, you'll find things like chairs just made by some local carpenter. Um, the, the windows are all hand-hewn wooden shutters and things on the windows, and the views from inside are often wonderful because you're high up. Um, so that's the countryside, a different shot of it, and one of the churches we were going to was in one of those cliffs. The cliff church is here, right? So you've got to get up there to get into it. So you climb up. <laughs> that's my friend Blair's bottom. <laughs> And when you get up there, there is an entrance with a small door and inside they're hewn out of the solid rock by hand. They're just extraordinary. Um, and there are often quite elderly priests, but there are young priests too, you'll see in a minute. This is not a dying religion. People, this is still very much practice, very much part of people's life. And the paintings are fantastic. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Mm. And uh, they just cover all the walls. And of course, sometimes the walls are leaking. And so there's, there's real issues about conservation. 
um, <clears throat> but they are just marvelous. So this one, I think, might be St. George, who is a major saint for the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. So he appears in a lot of these things, although I can't see a dragon, so I might be wrong. I'm not entirely sure. Um, all sorts of monks, and they all have stories. This monk was famous for riding on a lion. And he has a rather charming lion, I think. I rather like him. <laughs> um, and uh, this saint uh, had, a, had hair that covered his whole body like a coat. And he could talk to the animals. You can see the animals are lying at his feet, so he could talk to them. Um, and he lived for 562 years in the desert, which is quite an achievement. I'm working on it. <laughs> they have enormous drums, which have a wonderful deep sound. I do have a recording of a church ceremony, but I'm not going to play it to you now. After we're over, if anyone wants to hear it, I can switch screens and pull it up and we can do that. But I have to leave PowerPoint and it'll the technology will probably all go pear-shaped, so I'm not gonna do it now. Too risky, okay? Um, so we asked before we went, we said, what can we bring with us to like, give to the children and things? And you're usually told when you travel to these countries, don't bring candy, but bring pens or crayons or whatever. They told us bring reading glasses, go to the five and dime store and buy those cheap reading glasses that are plus one, plus two, plus three, and bring those. Because as the priests get old and their eyesight starts to fail, they have no access to reading glasses. So we bought a whole bunch of reading glasses and they all had different colored frames. And we tried to explain to them that they needed to try different ones on to see which ones worked for their eyes. But they really weren't interested. They just wanted the ones with the coolest frames. <laughs> So whether later on they sorted it all out and changed it around and, until they got ones that actually worked, I have no idea, but they were very pleased with them. Um, he's a rather fine gentleman. I, I can't tell you who he is, he is or was, I don't know. Um, the, one, the person on the right seems to have snakes instead of hair. So it's sort of like Medusa. There's obviously a story about this, but I, I'm afraid I don't know. Madonna and child, that's an easy one. Um, this reaching this church was quite quite something. If you look on the top left, you can see there's a narrow path and there's a vertical cliff. The path ends at the corner that we're all approaching there. And so you get there, you've got this cliff on one side, you've got a vertical drop on the, uh, I'm leaving my camera, sorry, vertical drop on the other. And the path ends. And what they tell you is you have to put your leg, I'm sorry people on Zoom, you can't see my legs, but anyway, you put your leg around the corner of the cliff and you will find there is a path on the other side. <laughs> now, I'm not very good with heights. So anyway, I trusted, I did it, I went around and indeed there was a path on the other side. And when you get inside the church, look at the views from that bottom photograph through the window. I mean, it's really spectacular. And this church has, uh, th these paintings have been dated to about the 14th century. So there's a baptism on the left. And I think that's probably David, with King David with his lyre on the right, most likely. Um, and this is Adam, a serpent is whispering in his ear. And he's, just for modesty purposes, he's got a, a, a sheepskin around his, around his nether parts. No, I think it's a sheepskin. <laughs> um, the old priest sits in the corner praying. Ah, so this extraordinary thing, if you look carefully at this picture, you can see a head at the top and feet at the bottom. So this is an enormous circular fan and it's made out of parchment. And if I go closer in here, each section has a saint painted on it and it was completely disintegrating and Blair's foundation has restored this. So now it's stabilized. So, and it's, but it's not brought out. It's normally kept in the monastery, but they brought it out for us because, because it was Blair. That's a beautiful thing. Um, this is one of the Bibles, a page of one of the Bibles. And you can see on the right that it's, it's actually in something called Ge'ez, which is the, um, it's the sort of the, the equivalent of Latin in that it's a liturgical language. It's not a spoken language anymore. Um, and then we moved at the end of this bit, this is the last shot from this bit of the trip, to the ancient city of Aksum. So these are taken in the city and these people are going to church. The women always wear white to go to church and the man, man on the right is carrying his fly whisk to sort of show his importance and so forth. Um, so still on the same trip, we left the north 
and we flew back to Addis Ababa and went just to the southeast of Addis Ababa to a part of the country uh, in the Rift Valley where the lakes are because uh, this was Blair, this was sort of the holiday part of the trip for Blair because she's a keen bird watcher. And so there's very good birds down there. So um, we were bird watching. And it's very different countryside, still horses everywhere. Interestingly, it's always the woman in control of the horse and the man sits behind every time, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it's, this, is no, this is not farm, this is not arable country, not crops. These are pastoral people. So they have uh, cattle, um, mainly cattle actually. And the lake is a, a very alkaline, it's a sort of soda lake and very shallow. Here's one of the herders with his rather splendid spear. And I asked why he was carrying the piece of grass. I thought this must be significant. And, and the guide said, no, no, he just likes it. So, <laughs> um, so that was uh, the cottage down there. Uh, uh, Colobus monkeys, who are the most beautiful things. And the baboons, the baboon came into my friend's cottage and took one of her trail bars and he took it outside and sat on a rock and bit straight through the trail bar, including the wrapping. Didn't like that at all, spat it out, went back in, took a second one and carefully unwrapped it and ate it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not stupid, but they're big and they're aggressive. So we watched this from a distance until they'd left. They did make quite a job on their cabin. I'm glad it wasn't my cabin. Um, the birds were wonderful, although I, I don't seem to have got terribly good bird pictures here. I have better bird pictures for you in the, the second trip that I took. But there are African fish eagles on the top left, a northern red bishop on the top right, and a pair of blue-capped cordon bleu little lovebirds in the bottom there that were all snuggled up together. So that's it right there. Ah, someone's not muted. Um, if you're joining us from Zoom, if you could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so that was, uh, that was that trip. And it was, oh, and one last bit of information. That lake at the end, we decided to go for a swim. And I was not sure it was a great idea, but anyway, we did. And so I was super careful. I swam like this with my head way out of the water. I wasn't careful enough. And when I got back to England, I had something called Shigella, which you don't want to get. <laughs> wasn't good. So um, somehow the water splashed. Anyway, not good. But other than that, we were fine. No one got ill, just that. And only after I got back and luckily not on the flight. <laughs> um, so the second trip was completely different. Uh, eight years later, 2019, hunting for the Ethiopian wolf. So Ethiopia has uh, a number of mammals that are endemic, which means they're not found anywhere outside Ethiopia. It's the only country in the world they exist. Yeah. And of them, five of them are endangered. The Ethiopian wolf, the giant mole rat, the Besa oryx, the mountain Nyala and Swain's hartebeest are all endangered. Uh, and the goal of the trip was to try and see as many of these mammals as we could. Uh, and, and then any other wildlife would be a bonus, but the particular hope. We, we, we were taken to places where we stood the best chance of seeing these particular animals. So here's my Google Maps of this trip. This is now south and um, a little bit east of Addis Ababa. The um, bottom circle, Bali Mountains, is where the wolves were found. The, the circle, the bottom left, uh, is another lake that I'm going to show you um, for cultural reasons rather than wildlife reasons. Uh, and the top circle were gelada baboons, which I'll come to at the very end. And the other wildlife was seen in a number of different places around here. Um, okay, please advance slide. Why? There we go. So this was the entrance to our first stop. This was a national park that had a lodge in it. And that's the view from the bar at the lodge. Not bad, huh? <laughs> it was just gorgeous. Um, this is our guide, Abby, and our driver, Fakir, and they were marvelous. I mean, all our guides on these trips were just so good, and the English was extremely good. So I'm going to start with the wolves because, you know, I have to, I mean, they were why, they were really why I went, and I really wanted to see them. So the Bali Mountains are high, They're, by our standards, 14,000 feet, that's a lot higher than Mount Washington. So although we're in relatively southern latitudes, it's pretty cold up there. 
So you had to wear, you know, you wore a parka and it rained and the wind blew and it's pretty darn cold. Um, and there's no trees because it's above that elevation. So it's scrubby, low vegetation. But it's very beautiful. Um, this is Park HQ. It's the only building in the park. Um, and there's the wolves. Oh. So you may say they don't look like wolves. That's fair enough. But they are officially wolves. Their Latin name is Canis simensis. Oh, um, and they live in small family groups of around six. And they don't hunt as a pack, unlike our wolves here in the United States, the timber wolves. Um, they hunt in a solitary way. And I've got some more pictures. But they were just charming. And we, and we looked all day. We saw them at the very end of the day. We were all starting to think, oh, we're not going to see them. <laughs> um, it's the most endangered carnivore in Africa. There are only 400 left in the wild. And half of them live in these mountains that we went to. Um, they are trying to protect them. If you kill one, you can go to jail for two years. So it's, they're taking it seriously. But they're still under threat. So subsistence farming, local villagers who need extra land and try to encroach on the national park areas, um, and uh, diseases and interbreeding from the local dog population, distemper and rabies. Um, in terms of size, they're round about like our coyotes in size, approximately. Um, and this one's beginning to hunt. You can see him prowling and you can see what the vegetation is like. It's low scrubby stuff. It's, it's called um, Afro-Alpine vegetation because of the high mountains and it's in Africa. Um, the one on the left is uh, still hunting and on the bottom right, it's not a very impressive photograph, but I, you, you need to understand that photograph took me all day to get. That is a giant mole rat. <laughs> and it is the favorite food of the Ethiopian wolves but they're called mole rats because they live underground. So what you do is you get taken to an area that looks like a sand, sand and gravel. It's just flat and there's nothing there, no plants, nothing. And the guide says, just settle down and watch. And then he says, there's a hole over there and you can't even see this hole. You know. He says, point your camera at the hole. <laughs> and up comes a mole rat, takes a look around and goes straight back down. So um, about guinea pig sort of size, something like that. Um, so you feel a bit like you're playing a game of whack-a-mole, except you don't whack them, but you know. So anyway, I did get, that's my only photograph of the giant mole rat, and they are also in danger. Um, so that's probably my best wolf portrait. And they are, they are lovely animals. Um, when I talked about habitat threat, as we were leaving the Bali Mountains, we saw this fire. It was a really big fire. And the guides went and talked to the park rangers and they said, well, the local village um, needs more land and they set the fire to clear land. Mm -hmm. And they said, we have no real way to put it out. And we've called national park headquarters in Addis, but it'll be probably days before anyone gets here. So mm -hmm. when this happens, the fires just burn out. Yeah? Um, okay, so that's, that's it for the walls. Then we went to this lake, Lake Awasa. Um, and this is not a wildlife thing really, but it, I thought it was a really interesting place. So these fishermen, um, notice their boats have no engines, just oars, uh, and they go out every morning on the lake. Here they are with their nets. And the fish come back into the, and, and just where those boats were pulled up, there are these little wooden shacks, and they're cleaning the fish. And they carefully take out all the innards that we normally would throw out. And those are sold to rich people for their dogs. And they made it very clear that only rich people can afford to feed their dogs on this. Okay, I'm not, and the poor people mostly don't feed their dogs at all. The dogs just roam and fend for themselves, as you'll see in a moment. Um, the fish market is a bit of a gathering place. So people bring their livestock down to drink. There are all kinds of scavenging birds, marabou storks all over the place. Um, there are carcasses, because if your animal dies, you're not going to bother to get rid of it. It's also where you play football. And if you're not playing football, then it's a good perch for a marabou stork. That's the goal. Oh, and England won! <laughs> In case you're not aware. Euro Euro European Cup soccer, just so you know. That's what I'm talking about. Um, okay. Um, this dog was happily chasing the marabou storks, having a wonderful time. Never got anywhere near them, but he was enjoying himself no end. Um, but the dogs just forage, if they, you know, for whatever they can find. 
Uh, and people come there to buy their fish. So he's been sent by his mom, I assume, to buy a couple of fish and he's taking them home. Um, so uh, we saw the other endemic mammals on that list. We saw all of them. Um, and I'm just briefly going to show you pictures because they're very beautiful. So this is Menelix bushbuck on the left, a bright gazelle on the right in the middle of marking his territory. It's not a very um, um, graceful position. <laughs> And a swain's hearty beast with her young on the, at the bottom. There. Um, this is a base of oryx, and they're so beautiful. And here's his close up. Aren't they wonderful? And this is the mountain Nyala. So the male is in that uh, top right hand picture in, in uh, very deep vegetation, and they're big, big animals. That's the only clear shot I got of one, because mostly they're in quite deep woods, as you can see on the left hand side. So that's a, a young male on the left with a female and a young one. The other shot. Um, the uh, top two photographs are both an Ethiopian hare. It's hiding under a rock on the left and out in the open. On. They're not the same hare, different hares. And a Grivitz monkey down below. And, and there are lots of other mammals. So all of those are found only in Ethiopia. These are found in other places too, but they're still pretty nice. So I thought I'd just add a few extra photographs in a reed buck and a bush diker and a warthog mother with, and her baby with an ox pecker on her back. And they're not very beautiful, but talk about motherly love. I mean, she loves her baby and vice versa, even though. <clears throat> um, these are a very graceful little antelope called an oribi, a perfect little family. Um, so that's it for mammals. There'll be a few birds, and I'm keeping one eye on the time because I, I want to make sure that you have time for questions. But So down here, the houses are not built of stone because you don't have those huge cliffs, so they're built of these sort of reed mats very often. But it's still the case that people mostly don't use motorized vehicles. Uh, these two girls were herding their goats and let us photograph them. And then we ended up in the town where there are motorized vehicles, as you can see, and the most appalling traffic jam. And in the middle of the traffic jam was a bridegroom and his bridal party, all his buddies. And they were all on horses together on their way to the bachelor party or the wedding, I'm not sure which, and they were having a high old time. And we were just stuck in a traffic jam with them. So I put my camera out of the window and photographed them. Um, and the birds were fantastic. So just a few bird pictures for those of you who like birds. Um, so the spot-breasted lapwing on the top left and the uh, Rouget's rail bottom left, those are both found only in Ethiopia, they're endemic but the Somali ostrich and the double-toothed barbit are found elsewhere. There are six different kinds of hornbills in Ethiopia. These are just three of them, and they're the most unlikely birds. I mean, how do you fly with a beak like that? You know, I have no idea. Um, but it, presumably it attracts the female hornbill. I mean, she has a pretty big, big beak as well, but there are a number of species of owls. I've only included two photographs of owls here, but they are gorgeous. Um, the northern carmine bee eater is pretty spectacular. The tawny eagle, not bad. Lots of sunbirds, which have these iridescent patches on them. So this iridescent green and bronze, and this is slightly blurry, but I just thought he was so splendid. He's, in, he's a male in his breeding plumage. They don't look like that all year round with that bright green back and yellow front. Um, the top left one is a, is a kind of parrot. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but he's a green parrot. You can just, and he has a red beak and a red face. And then there's a wattled ibis at the top. Those are big birds and a blue winged goose with these lovely blue wings. And the last wildlife, I'm just about going to get through this on time. Joe was very fulsome and so I'm, I'm cheating and I'm going to use an extra oh, five please, minutes. Please, I didn't take five. <laughs> I'm making an excuse. I promised George I wouldn't, I, that I would stay on time. So I've got to live up to my promise. Um, we ended this trip by going to the north of Addis Ababa to a monastery called Debre Libanos, which has a colony of gelada baboons. 
Most people see these by going to the Simeon Mountains in the northwest of Ethiopia, which we didn't go to on the first trip. Some of my friends did, but I didn't. Uh, but you can see them here. They live on the edges of these cliffs. It's extraordinary. I mean, that's, I don't know how clear the picture is, but that's a vertical drop of several hundred feet behind them. And they're not bothered, not remotely. So they're happily grooming each other on the edge of this cliff. And they have these extraordinary bright red chest patches. Um, absolutely brilliant red. In the early morning, they, they're a bit like meerkats. They find a piece of sun and they sunbathe because it's cold up there. And look at this vertical cliff, there's a baby. How it got there, I have no idea. It was perfectly happy. Its mother wasn't running around getting overexcited, saying, get down from there now, dear. You know. How did you get through more? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I was on a slightly flatter bit of land with a long zoom lens. <laughs> um, whoops. And uh, he's standing on the edge of the cliff, making it plain that he's the top guy. OK, so I, I want to end on a more somber note. Um, some of you may be aware of this if you've been reading the relevant parts of the papers. But um, to my great sadness, in the northern part of Ethiopia, Tigray, where we were on the first trip, um, there's now a, a civil war going on between Tigray and the rest of Ethiopia. And it's catastrophic. Um, so just very brief history on here. So Ethiopia was at war with Eritrea, the neighboring country, uh, for several years. Um, and then Ethiopia itself ha had a Marxist government for a very long time, which was eventually overthrown. And once they overthrew it, Tigrayans, for various reasons, ended up filling most of the leadership positions for the country as a whole, even though they're a small minority of the population, but they filled the leadership positions. And then in 2018, a new prime minister was elected who is not from Tigray. He made peace with Eritrea, for which he got the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, uh, but that, so, so far, this is all looking promising, but things have now gone badly wrong. First, there was a terrible plague of locusts, which is nobody's fault, but it's still devastating for their crops in Tigray. And then the um, federal elections were canceled because of COVID or postponed, I should say. And Tigray decided to go ahead anyway with their provincial elections. And the prime minister uh, took exception to this and it's all spiraled downhill into a major civil war. And um, they cut off all communications. There's famine in a great deal of the province. Uh, it's really horrifying. And it's still very much in flux because in the last, uh, since the 27th of June, it's all flipped. The, the, the Tigrayan pr province, their forces have pushed out the government forces and retaken the capital. And it's now in their hands. Um, and I, no, I have no idea what's going to happen or where it's going to go. So it's, it's pretty horrifying. And the last few slides are now a bit out of date. But basically, red means this is just Tigray, just that province. Red means that a lot of civilians died. You don't have to worry about the details, really. Um, and these maps are from the UN. This is from The Economist. This show civilian deaths and famine risks. Um, and um, Ethiopia blocked off all the international aid agencies, weren't allowed in with food aid or medical aid or anything. Um, so it's been and still is a pretty horrible mess, which is extremely sad. I would love to go back. Um, so I'm gonna tell you one tiny anecdote and then we've got some question time. The anecdote is what happened when I came back into the United States. So I don't know about you, but I get to the man at the desk and I show my passport and I somehow I always feel guilty even though I'm not, but I just feel guilty. You know? <laughs> so, you know, and you have to say, where have you been since you were last home in the United States? And so I'd filled out a list which included Ethiopia and he stares at it and says, said, Ethiopia, huh? And I thought, well, what's gonna happen? And he said, isn't it a wonderful country? <laughs> and it is, and he's right. So thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. I can, once I can find it here. Hold on a minute. Um, Seeing if we can invoke yeah. our invisible audience. Come, uh, Joe, come around here because my normal, the normal place that gallery view would be has gone missing. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. 
Oh well, yeah. sh stop sharing. I'm going to do. I stop sharing. Yes, I'm going to do That's, stop sharing, yes. and then, then you'll have. Then, then, then you should then be able to get it. Yeah. Okay. There, go. Okay. there we go. Okay. Okay. So now, now I've got the gallery view. It should, because this is supposed to be mirroring. So I'm not sure why it's not mirroring. Well, I'll close down. Hold on. I'm hearing myself coming back. Why is it not mirroring? We might need uh, Gilson again here, I suspect. Um, well, meanwhile, why don't you take the question yeah. from yeah. the audience? Yes, exactly. exactly. See if you can get them to mirror again, because we want to get this screen up there. Up there. Um, so, yeah, I can certainly take questions from here. And I think the Zoom audience can probably hear me. So I will repeat the question and they can hear even if they can't. Yes. No. Colors on the paintings in the churches are amazing. Yeah. Have they been redone, or are there, those are plant dyes, I assume? So the question is that the colors on the paintings in the churches are amazing, considering how old a lot of the paintings are. Have they been restored? Uh, are they plant dyes or whatever? Um, some of them have been restored. The vast majority haven't. Of course, they are in caves, so they're not exposed to light. And that makes a gigantic difference. Uh, and, and a relatively constant humidity level and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting large numbers of tourists, although they do, they do use the churches, so people go in. Um, and yes, they would have been plant, um, plant and mineral based. Some of them might be minerals. They would not be modern chemical things. Yes. How big are the churches, the churches? How high up are they? So uh, how big are the cliffs? How high up are they? Um, the most the ones I saw are mostly pretty small. So Ethiopia does have some very large churches. The ones that people from the west visit most often are in a place called Lalibela, where they're built down. They're carved, but they're built down in a pit, carved down into the ground. I didn't actually go there. And those are on a relatively accessible tourist route with reasonable hotels and things. So those those you can see, and they're big, and they have. And in fact, if I do end up playing you, I won't be able to unless I can get the screen to work. Um, the recording of the ceremonies that was a big, big service in Lalabella. So these are small churches to serve small local populations. And in some cases, what they're now doing is they're building a second church at the base of the cliff so that you don't always have to climb the cliff every time you want to go to church. How high up are they? Um, I suppose the longest climb we did took us maybe an hour. But the Ethiopians scamper up pretty darn fast. It doesn't take them an hour. To us no, now, being to old, middle-aged, non-local people. But I, I don't know how you translate that into feet. I'm afraid I'm not sure. But they're at the top of some of those cliffs that I showed in the photograph, so they're pretty high up. There's a question way in the back. Well, it's a somewhat similar question about how, so I think they're pretty small. We didn't actually see any services. We weren't in, inside any of the churches on a Sunday. Um, I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say you'd struggle to get more than uh, 40 people into most of those churches. And some of them, I, you know, fewer. I mean, they're more like chapels in our parlance than churches, really. Um, so, yeah. They're not big, but it, it, as you saw, it's a very rural area, so they're not serving a big population, so they wouldn't have had to have. There you go. Ah, well done, Gilson. Good job. Eventually. Okay. Thanks to our technician, Gilson Reken. We're back. Well done. <laughs> um, any other questions for in here? Yes. Yeah, there's some here. I can see the chat. Okay. Um, no, they're not. They're, they say thank you, but they don't. They're not questions. <laughs> um, what do they use to carve the stone? To? What do they use to carve the stone? <laughs> well, um, th this is not. These are not. Um, I mean, these were built after metal tools existed, so they would have been metal tools. Um, but I don't actually know for sure. Um, my friend Blair would know, pity she's not here, but she's in London, so that's not, gonna, not going to help you, so I can't tell. But you can see that they're hand, you know, it's clearly hand tools. Is it yeah. more like sandstone? 
just one second um is um i would say that it's harder than sandstone um i ought to, i ought to know what stone it is it's not granite um maybe it is sandstone but it was rel it didn't have that crumbliness that sandstone sometimes has um i'm not doing a very good job with these questions you're asking me <laughs> things i don't know the answers to you had a question um yeah, do you know about the geology of those cliffs? There you go. See, same question. I should have done my homework on this. I don't. Um, we could look it up, or you could look it up. So geology of Tigre, of, you know. So I was around near a town called Michele. So if you look that up, you could find out. I'm not going to do it now because we've just got this screen back, and who knows what will happen if I try to look it up. Yeah, question in the front. I in the, I want to go back to the wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, are, is any of the wildlife endangered in the way other African wildlife is endangered by poaching? Um, to some extent. Uh, so the various kinds of the various kinds of antelope, um, you know, people eat. They're good food. So um, so that is certainly, and people are poor, and they have families to feed. Yeah. Um, but the big, as in much of Africa, the biggest single threat is usually habitat loss. You know, po populations are increasing, people need land to farm, land for their livestock. Um, and so the, the, the areas for these animals to live in gets eroded slowly but surely. Um, and what, what Ethiopia doesn't at the moment have is a, um, a money-making wildlife tourism business that makes it worth the local people's while to keep the animal population there. I mean, when conservation works well in Africa, it's very often because the local people are now invested in it. It brings jobs if you can keep the elephant population healthy. Um, I mean, yes, they trample your crops, but they also bring in wealthy tourists. But Ethiopia doesn't have any of that infrastructure yet. Mm -hmm. so. uh, question in the way back. I, if I kept my glasses on, I could see that would be a good idea. <laughs> on your second trip, when mm -hmm. you made the wildlife, track, mm -hmm. yeah, it was arranged mm -hmm. in Great Britain. Yes, and yet the guys, so they had a structure in place with local people that they hired. Yes, so mm, this this company, Nature. Question. I'm sorry, I have to repeat the question. Apologies. Um, the question was the the second trip I went on, the wildlife trip was arranged from England, which it was, uh, and yet my guides were local guides. And so there must be local guides you know, available to do such things. Um, so yes and yes, it was arranged from England, but most of the trips arranged by this company and pretty much every British or American company I travel with, they do use local guides. Sometimes they also send out a guide from the UK or America with a group, but mostly not, I mean, uh, it sort of depends on what kind of trip it is. For something like this, local guides are essential. So for example, you know, we had a guy, I mean, the local guides hire even more local guides to help them. So we had a guy who knew where the owl was nesting. So he took us to the tree where the owl was nesting, right? Whereas the guides who were with us for the whole two weeks and drove around with us wouldn't have known where the owl was nesting. Um, so you kind of have layers of <laughs> expertise. Um, and, and they're very good at what they do. They really are, they're excellent. So the money filters mm -hmm. down. The money filters down. So, so when I said it wasn't yet worth their while, I was, I mean, that's not entirely true because they're beginning to get tourists, but it's still very small scale and it's only for tourists who have an appetite for a certain kind of travel um, at the moment. You know, and, and they, they, they will start to try and build um, the kind of infrastructure that Western tourists would expect and then for various reasons, it doesn't work. So we stayed in one hotel when we arrived that looked like quite a smart modern hotel. And apparently it had been built by one of the marathon runners that Ethiopia produces in spades and who become heroes in Ethiopia because they're such extraordinary runners and they become fairly wealthy. And so he had run a business and he had built a couple of hotels. I can't actually remember which of the runners it was. Um, and so it all looked great, but there was no water. And I mean, I do mean no water, none. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so they would bring one bucket of water to your room in the morning that you had to use for washing and flushing the toilet, and then you could get bottles of water to brush your teeth. So, you know, they'd started off with what looked like a perfectly decent hotel, but it didn't quite live up to expectations. So, yeah. 
Um, yes. Could you talk about your transportation? Uh, could I talk about our transportation? Um, so I think I mentioned at the beginning that the first step getting to Ethiopia with Ethiopian Airlines was uh, excellent. They're a very good airline and they have absolutely brand new planes, one of which unfortunately is a 737 MAX. And the week after I flew back to London on a 737 MAX, exactly one week later, another one crashed and killed everyone on board. Yeah. But that's Boeing's, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't get into this. Anyway, <laughs> I don't, Ethiopian Airlines is a very well-run airline and um, it, it feels like flying on a, uh, an American airline the way things used to be back in the good old days. You know? <laughs> um, and the staff are charming and very efficient and everything works and it's all fine. So that was step one, was, was that. Uh, and then we had a van that was a bit rickety, but, but, and, and the van took us around everywhere. And, and it, well, there were 12 of us, no, sorry. Um, yeah, there were 12 of us on that trip too. So the van was just big enough for all of us and it was fine. I mean, it wasn't luxurious, but it worked. Didn't break down at all, so that was good. <laughs> um, a question at the very back. When you were looking for the uh, animals, did you mm -hmm. go to primarily preserves or the national parks? Or yes. just out in the yes. wild and no. these local guides know no. where to find them? No. It's a very good question. Um, it was a mixture. Most of these very endangered animals, there are now places where they have preserves of varying different sizes for. Um, so they were at least partially protected. The, the problem is that they don't have the means and the, the, the intention is there, but actually truly protecting them is, is not easy. I mean, I showed you that picture of the wildfire that was within a national park. Um, and it was sorry, and it wasn't a wildfire, it was a fire deliberately set by the local village. Um, but yes, most of these were in preserves, but the preserves are not like we would really think of them here. I mean, you, you drive for miles and miles and miles in the middle of nowhere, and, and then there's one small gate and a bunch of barbed wire, and, and it turns out you've reached the reserve, but you wouldn't actually know if someone didn't tell you. <laughs> um, Yes, Joe. Did you have any uh, experience of uh, the language variety in Ethiopia, or was it all English yeah. for you, and you weren't aware of yeah. translations here and there? Well, we only spoke English. None of us, other than our guides, spoke any um, of the Ethiopian languages. Um, I mean, you could hear the guides switching from Tigrinya to Amharic as we moved through different parts of the country. Um, and if they were, you know, Tigrinya was what they would like to speak to each other because they were both from Tigray, uh, but they both spoke Amharic because it's the national language. And if you have any degree of education, you, well, every, they all learn it at school. Um, but um, no, I didn't really. I had a different hat on my head. I didn't have my linguist's hat on my head, so, so no. I should say, by the way, that we're, we ha we're out of time. And if, I mean, you're very welcome to stay. I'm happy to answer more questions, but you're also welcome to leave. And I won't be remotely insulted because we've used up our hour. And I'm very grateful that you came. Thank you.